seven lines down about the similarity of pattern uh, between the hand of, of, of a man, a monkey, a foot of a horse, flipper of a seal, the wing of a bat, etc., is utterly inexplicable without further up had we not had a common progenitor. He meant, re, reminds us of embryos as we work our way down. Um, he reminds us of the development of the embryo that he accentuated, he, he mentioned, what, five, ten minutes ago. And in his last paragraph, he's really trying to sell it. Um, let me find it. Yeah, probably... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines up on the right. It is. So here we go. It is only our natural prejudice and that arrogance, I underlined that a lot, which made our forefathers declare that they were descended from demigods, which leads us to demur to this conclusion. But the time will before long come when it will be thought wonderful. Now, let me point out that that means we'll wonder why. Not, oh, that's wonderful. Okay, we'll wonder why that naturalists, people who study nature, who are well acquainted with the comparative structure and development of man and other animals, should have believed that each was the work of a separate act of creation. So whether you want to subscribe to Darwin or not, many people, of course, have. Maybe they don't in Texas. Right? But there he is. He's saying it as strongly as he possibly can. Um, and he also uses the words prejudice and arrogance. And you know, we might even remember the quote from Goethe regarding the Copernican system. What became of the nice, simple world we had before, but now with Copernicus, and I would claim with Darwin, demands a different point of view. So, and it's said at the end of the table, Darwin is doing what, uh, to biology, uh, the same that Newton and Galileo et al. did to the physical. Well, I gave you a few other things here. These are very nice um, articles by John Maynard Smith, and then another one by Fred Hoyle. And just checking my time. We'll talk about Hoyle next time, I think as well as having read Weinberg. Uh, right? We certainly have time to work on John Maynard Smith. So this is more detailed now. How did nervous systems evolve, for instance? Why would it be connected to flight? And it's interesting that he's not only a biologist, but he spent some time as an aeronautical engineer. So it's kind of appropriate for uh, trying to get these two fields together. And he talks about stability of flying. And, uh, and I, I, I am prepared to give you an example. So I'm going to make a paper airplane. His point is, is that an unstable airplane, or a stable airplane, any doofus can fly, including me. An unstable airplane requires some talent. You know, while I'm folding this airplane, what do you think a more stable configuration for walking would be? Four legs or two? You know where I'm going on that. So how do we get good at walking on two legs? Pulling our arms out? <laughs> well, no, a quick response system with our brain. Right? So 
along with bipedalism, the brain was evolving to handle that. Of course, it had a positive feedback. Once two of our limbs were free <coughs> from walking, they could do other things too, right? And start messing around with tools and all that sort of thing. So there was a double benefit, not only by going to two legs, the brain got better at handling the instabilities and then its byproducts, it got smarter for other things. It also then released our arms so that they could get into their own mischief, so to speak, and make us even smarter because now we've got something else to do with our forepaws. So here's an airplane, classic airplane. Pretty stable flight, right? No need for control. You're going to have to send it back to me. We'll be doing this a lot. Thank you. Nice talk. Okay. So I learned from some of my engineering friends that stability uh, occurs for things like this if the center of mass is in front of the center of lift or the center of the wing. Now to find the center of mass, you know how to find the center of mass or something? I just thought really good. Balance it. Yeah, balance the doggone thing. There's the center of mass, right? Somewhere there. Now, look at where most of the air wing is. Most of the wing is behind the center of mass. And that makes for a stable configuration. And when he talks about flying animals, you know, gliding along, okay? Yeah, you can, you can be reading a newspaper well, you know, while you're gliding along. You don't need anything special to do that. But now I want to, I can't shift the wings around, but I've brought some masses here. Actually, I hope they just fall out of my pocket. Here's one. There should be another one. Ah, here we go. So I got a couple of paper clips. So I could put these somewhat heavy paper clips in the back. And now I've shifted it back away. Okay. Let's give this a try. Isn't that cool? It's not stable anymore. Nevertheless, it's pretty gymnastic, isn't it? It's agile. And what John Maynard Smith tries to point out is, is, yeah, nice, uncontrolled gliding is, is simple. But if prey, if a hawk comes zooming by, and all you can do is glide, right, the hawk's going to just come right in and you're breakfast. Right? Which is, my, I might add, a characteristic of life that eats them. On the other hand, if you're agile and if you're in control, here comes the hawk and you just do a 90 degree turn on that guy and then you come up over to the side and then you roll over, well, think of fighter pilots, right? pulling eight G's. My college roommate, we all, we all some, of, some of us got drafted, some of us had to join. I got drafted, he joined the Air Force. And yeah, he was a fighter pilot pulling 8G. I still can't imagine it. I freak out on roller coasters. Well, I digress. Anyway. But you can see where, I'm, where, where John has taken us here, Mr. Smith, is that by developing a less stable form, but by putting something smart up in the front end to control it, then we're agile, we can control, and we're going to survive. And in fact, that's what birds have done. They have evolved body of a bird, you, you stick a bird out, uh, you know, stuff one poor little sucker and have his feathers out and everything, throw him through the air, he's just going to, right? But he's got a bird brain. I guess that isn't the best of advertisements, but it's smart <laughs> enough, it's smart enough so that he can control his flight and avoid predators and also predate better himself as well. So that's an example, a microcosm 
uh, the evolution of not only the body, but of the brain. The last thing, so we won't talk about this today, but the last reading before we do um, uh, Weinberg is uh, Man in the Universe by Fred Hoyle. I really like this, how he, again, points out the, he talks about the evolution of biology based on chemistry and biology based on electronics. And I particularly like the fact that he used the term electronics. Now, that envisions, or to me it envisions uh, a warm radio with lots of tubes glowing in the darkness, but that's, <laughs> again, out of the 50s and 60s. But certainly transistors, electrons going all over the place, you know, they're causing all kinds of things like that. But of course, that's also the nervous system, too, right? And how did we develop this remarkable electronic computer? Is really where he's going. It's sitting on top of our necks. And, and it's because of the law of tooth and fang out there. And he makes a convincing argument. So uh, keep that in mind as you read these few short pages. It's really, I think, very, very appropriate. Well, I'm done. We just have a couple minutes. Any, any comments before we stop? <laughs>